It says record. Now you got to make sure it lines up.
Father God, we come before you today with our hearts open. Uh, we ask that you lead us in worship to you, Lord, that we can consider what you do and who you are in our life and that we can respond appropriately. Lord, we know that one of the things that you ask from us is our requests. Uh, and as we have talked about those that we love and care about and those uh, that we work with and uh, have around us, we do want to extend a, a prayer for them, uh, asking for that you will intercede in their life, uh, Lord, that you will heal uh, in those opportunities uh, as uh, they present themselves, that you will give doctors wisdom uh, as they have a chance to understand what the situation is. Uh, Lord, we pray against uh, the enemy and his destructive ways, and we pray uh, that the power of your spirit uh, can be seen in our lives so that we can worship you even more. Uh, thank you, Lord, for our family and friends. We ask that you be a blessing upon them today. Help us in our worship of you as well. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, we're going to do something different. Uh, instead of living for Jesus, <laughs> leave it to the preacher. It's Fifth Sunday. What we've tried to do on Fifth Sundays is keep the young people up here with us during the message. So as part of a kids program, uh, we're going to sing, I've Got Peace Like a River. Is that in the book anywhere? Does anybody know? Someone want to dig real quick. Peace Like a River. Is it in there? Anyway, with that, I want to extend the opportunity for the young people if they want to. Oh, it is. There we go. 750 in your books. That's where we're going to go instead. 750, Peace Like a River. There we are. We'll sing four verses, Peace Like a River, Love Like the Ocean, Joy Like the Fountain, and then we'll sing one where you go, Peace First, Then Joy, Then Love. But does any young person want to come up and sing with us? They're welcome to do that. Greg, you want to come up here Greg and sing? Come and sing. Any young person want to? Kayla, you want to come sing with us? I'll teach you the motions. It's real simple. Please, I can remember. Nobody, okay. We'll sing it again in the service. And we'll give you that
Uh, and so last time we got together, we highlighted the uh, Oil Belt Christian Service Camp, who we send money to. Uh, and today, uh, the uh, mission team uh, wanted us to highlight uh, the Oblong Children's Christian Home. Uh, again, both of these organizations I have spent a lot of my time with, uh, and uh, so I know pretty well. Uh, but part of your monies, uh, the gifts that we give through the church, go to these different uh, missionaries. And so what we do, uh, as uh, the year comes around, maybe some of it's monthly, some of it's annually, we'll send a check to some of these places. The Oblong Children's Home is a new place uh, for our church to support. Uh, and what it basically is, is a home for children who have troubles with their families and they need a place to go to get themselves and to allow their families to get themselves right so that they can eventually be reunited. It's not a place for orphans. Uh, it, it's not a place for kids who don't have their own families. It's a case for kids who need a place where they can go and get things straightened out. Sometimes uh, it's a pretty desperate situations that put them there. Sometimes it's just tragedies that put them there. Uh, and yes, my mom and dad were house parents and other things. Uh, they're at the children's home for years and years, and we're not telling those stories today. So uh, beware of that. Here's just some pictures of uh, where... Uh, that what the children's home looks like. Uh, this is a place up at Oblong, less than an hour away. The idea was for VBS to invite uh, one of the uh, presenters from the children's home to come down and reacquaint us with the <laughs> ministry there. And so that's still going to be put into the works as we move forward. We're not sure of when. Uh, but that way we can get to know them a little bit more and start doing some things to help them out. Uh, they always have different things that they need help with outside of just uh, monetary donations. Uh, they also have a big storehouse. Uh, when you talk about, uh, I think there are four different houses that they have going now with kids in each of them. Some of them have two, or some of them have four, some of them have six kids. There's a house for ladies. Uh, there's a house for uh, ladies who are trying to get back on their feet after they've had uh, a, a child, uh, kind of helping the single uh, mom out in that respect. Uh, and so they have lots of different programs uh, that need support, uh, including food and uh, simple products uh, and stuff like that, that we hope to be able to support them with uh, in that respect. So the Avon Christian Children's Home, not that far away, uh, but is one of the missions that we do support uh, where your money goes just to try to acquaint yourselves uh, with that. Let's go ahead then and, and get into our message for today. And, and I want to start just with that idea, mission. You know, I think that uh, we need to go on a mission trip. Uh, I think that's something that this church hasn't done for a while uh, and it would be a good thing for us to do. I mean, mission gives us a uh, perspective on life. It gives us a chance to help. Uh, as I'm rem reminded of this, of the baby bottles uh, missions that we support is also due uh, next Sunday. So make sure that you get uh, your baby bottles filled up and bring them in by next Sunday. But there's lots of ways that we can reach out to our world to show that we care. And sometimes it's just by writing a check and giving money. And those are very appropriate opportunities. But at the same time, sometimes we're called, like the Bible tells us to, to go. To go, to reach out, to go and get involved and to go and learn what's happening in these places. Uh, I've had the opportunity, being a part of church and being a part of youth ministries for several years, to take young people and to take church people uh, on some of these trips. And, and it used to be the way of life. You know, every year we were looking for a place where we could go and where we could put some effort into, where we could go uh, and serve. I remember um, doing all kinds of projects uh, to help God's churches in that way. Uh, we spent some time out in Pine Haven in the children's home out there cutting firewood forever uh, up and down the mountain. That was an experience uh, of a lifetime, not just being in Montana, but the work that was needed to keep their houses going in the winter uh, to make sure that they had uh, plenty of firewood to do that. Uh, I remember going uh, for a during uh, Bible colleges and help setting up churches. Maybe it was a church plant that was getting ready to get started and so they would take a group of Bible college students and go and canvas the area. We spent a week just walking around and passing out uh, pamphlets and putting them on people's doors and trying to make conversation with people, letting them know that new churches, uh, a new church was getting started uh, there in their area. Uh, I remember that being in Colorado, going out to Providence and helping some new churches uh, just to do some youth programs and some vacation Bible schools uh, to be a part of that. Uh, but in many times when you do a mission trip, 
what you end up doing is working. You know, it, it comes with a little bit of effort. You don't always just get to send money. You don't always just uh, get to go and, and visit and talk. Sometimes it's a matter of cleaning, of cooking, of painting, of straightening. And, and I remember several times uh, going to places on these trips and working on the church buildings themselves. Uh, we had a missionary friend who was down in Mexico. And we spent uh, a couple different trips going down and helping them build uh, their church building. Uh, very rudimentary. I mean, it wasn't fancy, uh, but they needed a place where they could worship God, and we were a part of that. Uh, there were places that we went and just cleaned up the building, uh, where the whole week was spent shoveling uh, and moving things uh, and trying to get things prepared. And so what, what, the reason that I bring that up is to highlight the missions that we support, but also to uh, introduce the text for today, 1 Corinthians chapter, tick, uh, chapter 6. <sighs> Am I talking that fast? It feels like it this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. If you have your Bibles, let's start reading verse 1, and then we'll skip down and read verses 7, and then we'll go even further a little later on in our time together. Uh, but uh, the First Corinthians is about getting the church uh, prepared to live rightly, uh, and chapter 6 has several issues that Paul is, in some sense, maybe you can see it this way, working on the church, trying to get them ready, trying to get them prepared. Verse 1, chapter 6, he says this, If any of you has a dispute with another, dare he take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the saints? issue that was going on there in the church. We'll skip down to verse 7 and continue on. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means that you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor the adulterers, nor the idolaters, nor male prostitutes, or homosexual offenders, nor thieves, or the greedy, or drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. Last week we talked about the sin of sexual immorality, and this week it's the sin of lawsuits uh, that Paul brings up. Uh, and then the rest of the chapter moves back into dealing with some of the sexual sins, and, and then even later in chapter 7, uh, some of the different relationships that we have. And the apostle is bringing up each of these items because the church there at Corinth had succumbed to the culture instead of living as Christians, attracting others to a better way of life. Paul is upset here because this church in Corinth uh, had taken on the Greek behavior that is demonstrated as a stereotypical Greek, uh, lawsuits. Uh, when you think about the culture that we have today and how many lawyers and how many lawsuits uh, are a part of our culture, uh, we have to remember that this is not a new thing. Uh, ancient Greek was known for its lawsuits. Uh, in fact, one of the Greek playwrights, Aristophanes, see I made it through that word, that was good, uh, as one of his characters look at the map in the middle of the play and trying to find out where Greece is located, and when it's pointed out to him, he replies, well, there has to be some mistake because he can't see any lawsuits going on there uh, because they were always out trying to sue and take advantage uh, of other people in that, in that way. Yeah, you know, and it's, again, it's something that we're very, very familiar with. Uh, America files an average of 12 million lawsuits uh, a year. And they're handled by 1.3 million lawyers licensed in the United States who rank, who bring in over $170 trillion. Uh, like the Corinthians, uh, many Americans have aired their dirty laundry out publicly with the TV shows uh, of Judge Judy. Uh, remember, uh, The People's Court uh, and some of the other talk shows. I don't even know if that kind of show uh, is still even on today. Uh, but the way that people would try to gain advantage and try to sort things out and, and do it in such a a, 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 a public way was, as Paul is pointing out here in chapter 6, right downright despicable. He was upset because these Christians were supposed to be more loving and they were supposed to be demonstrating unity in their community. However, they would bring their cases before this judgment seat that was located in the public arena and they were airing their dirty laundry for everyone to see. It became a shame for them. 
It wasn't good for a church that was trying to influence people, talking to them about Jesus and how they could live better and how Jesus could provide answers for their sin, for them to be involved in all of these lawsuits tarnished the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Remember what Jesus said. Turn the other cheek. Uh, we had a conversation just this week uh, about somebody making somebody mad. And uh, Elijah says, uh, Dad, uh, I'm not supposed, is it okay if I swing back? And I said, well, uh, the, actually they get two punches. <laughs> uh, if you look at the way that Jesus says, uh, for you to turn the other cheek and let someone else uh, and not try to solve everything with your own power. I don't think that there are many people necessarily uh, here of the ones that we know that have drugged other Christians in the court. But the root of the problem that plagued the Corinthians still pesters people today. We can't disagree. Uh, we can't agree. We are always in disputes. There's always something that have uh, inf infringed upon our rights that we feel like we have to get back uh, and, and get what is owed to us. It's unfortunate that we just can't get along. So when you read this passage here in chapter 6, it's real simple. Don't sue other Christians. But the correct understanding is a talking point that goes even deeper than that, and that's what I want to spend a little bit of time with today. Chapter 1 talks about how, or verse 1 talks about how ashamed they are that they're into these disputes, but do you see the attitude that they ought to have? Let's reread uh, verses uh, 7 and 8, uh, and it says this, The very fact that you have lawsuits among you, among the church, means that you have already been completely defeated. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this uh, to your brothers. You know, all, there's always uh, judgments that are, that are to be made, uh, but think about the principle that he's talking about. He's saying, why would you take these judgments to unspiritual people instead of people who know what it means to follow God to help set things right uh, among you? And, and then he says, wouldn't it be better to not have to be right? You know, sometimes it's okay to know that you have been taken advantage of and still, by in the name of Jesus, surrender that over to the person, allowing them, not that they get a special advantage over you, but showing you that those things of earth don't really matter as much as the things of heaven. That we're not just natural men, and that's his conversation here. Why would you go to the worldly to solve something that you know spiritually uh, to be right. They don't understand. We've already had that conversation in the earlier chapters, how the natural man doesn't understand the things of God uh, because they're foolishness to him. So why would we go and try to find resolve from someone who doesn't understand who we are uh, as Christians? And so what he's trying to say is, that, you know, it's not just that we should let someone else get the upper hand. It's not just that we uh, have to, uh, we aren't able to argue or stand up and scream or go and protest when, when things don't go our way. But chapter 6 reminds us that as Christians, our nature has changed. We're spiritual. We're changed. We need to believe that we are changed and let God work through us in that change. It's time for the church to act like God's in charge. Actually, the reality is he's still in charge. It's time for the church to act like they believe that God is in charge. It's time for the church to act like they believe that God can handle the problems uh, that, that we face, that it's okay for us uh, to let somebody else uh, win over us at occasion because we know that in the end that God is the one who will create justice and God will hold people accountable in that way. Chapter 6 reminds us not just that lawsuits are what's wrong, but that we are different from the world. We are spiritual. They are not. The story for, comes from the book of Ezekiel uh, with, with the passage that reminds us that God, uh, when, we, when he takes control of our life, takes out that heart of stone and puts in that heart of flesh. If you remember the other story there in Ezekiel, where there's, there's a valley of dry bones, uh, and God tells Ezekiel, do you think these bones can walk? And Ezekiel very wisely says, God, if you want to make them walk, they can. And he witnesses uh, them uh, coming together and being built back in the flesh upon them and, and given life. That's the idea that Paul is trying to uh, 
a company with this issue of the lawsuits is that we are different from the world. We have been renewed. In fact, it continues on there in the verses that are ahead of us. One of the greatest verses in Scripture is right there in verse 11, chapter 6, when we're reminded who we are in Christ. Before we get there, chapter or verse 9 says, oh, those people who won't inherit God's kingdom, reminding us those who live fleshly, and he gives us a list that we talked about even last week. But verse 11 says this, this is what you were, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. This is not an extrapolation of the same idea, washed, sanctified, justified. Those are words that we've used in the past few weeks. And, and understand what they've meant. We've been washed. God's Spirit has made us clean. Uh, we've been baptized uh, into the blood of Jesus. We are changed because of that. We are sanctified. Sanctified is that word that means set apart. That means that we ought to live differently than the rest of the world. That means that someone ought to be able to look at us and see, oh, they're a Christian just from the attitude that they have, from the words that come out of their mouth, from the entertainment that they have on their televisions and on their phones. They ought to see us as different uh, because we have been redeemed and we're justified. That's the best word there. A reminder that we are made just before God by the blood of Christ. That our sins, they are there that is who we are as sinners, but through Jesus, they have been washed away. And we have been justified. We have been uh, redeemed. In some ways, what he's telling us is we've been washed, we've been justified, we've been sanctified. It, it is that we've been cleaned. You know, we've got the smells out. Uh, you can tell that we have the house. Uh, we live in a house with dogs. Uh, and it just so happened uh, yesterday uh, that uh, they cut the fields uh, beside our house, which is great. It was just grass. It was time to get rid of it anyway. But with the, with the tall leaves there, the dogs haven't wandered very far out when they go outside uh, to run and play. The one will for a little bit because he hops. But as the grass gets so high, he can't see over when he hops. Uh, he kind of stays away from it. The other, the big dog's too scared. He kind of just runs the edge of the field. But they cut the grass down. You know what that means uh, last night. They had free reign exactly, and they ran everywhere, and they found dead animals. Yeah. Not live dead animals. Not, I mean, not, not animals that they would play with, but you know what dogs do. Oh, dead animals. Oh, I think that we need to create a brand new scent. Uh, and they roll, and my mom was watching them, and I can't believe she just giggled while this was happening. Uh, they were rolling and playing, and oh, they were having so much fun, she said, uh, instead of stopping them. Uh, we brought them in, and of course, what we had to do was wash them and give them a bath and get them cleaned up and spray stuff on them. And I'm not always sure what it is with a dog. Does it, do they smell better when they're filthy like that, or do they just smell better when they're wet? You know, that dog wet smell. Uh, either way, it was quite a mess. So, guess what happens this morning after they got all cleaned up? The one knew exactly where he was going, right? And I haven't found that spot yet. I'm going to find it today and get it taken care of so we don't deal with this issue again and again and again. And that's the problem that Paul says is happening with the church. We're dogs. We are always running back to the way that we have always lived. And we always want to hold on to those sins that get us down and we know is wrong. But we have to remember through Jesus, we are washed, we are justified, we are sanctified, we are called to be different. Uh, we are cleansed from our immorality, we are cleansed from our greed, we are cleansed from our manipulation and always having to be right. We are cleansed, and then as he takes a chapter along the verse that we haven't read yet, we are cleansed so that we can worship God. If you have your Bible still open, let's look at that last verse there. The last couple of verses there in verse in chapter uh, 16, uh, verses 18 uh, through 20, uh, it says this: Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? 
You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Another great verse that reminds us the way that we act and why we should act the way that we have because God has taken care of us. God has provided for us. God has given so that we can live sanctified. In fact, he takes the same idea that he said earlier in chapter 3 that you are a temple of God. You are the place where the presence of God lives. How is it that you can be a part of sexual immorality? How is it that you can be a part of all of this bickering and disputes among you? You are supposed to be the Lord's church. The Lord's children live like it. That's the call that Paul tells us, that we are to be that temple, that place where people can find the presence uh, of Jesus. You know, there's not many other sites that are more disappointing uh, than going through some of the ruins and seeing these old temples or maybe even old church buildings. They have kind of uh, been uh, take, not taken care of for a long time. Uh, I One of the things, uh, the mission trips that we did, going back uh, to that idea, uh, we took a mission trip when I was in Oblong uh, to one of the inner city churches uh, there in St. Louis. I had a friend, uh, and he said, hey, you want to do something? Come on, we'll do something, get something ready for you. And so I'm always up for the challenge. I think it'll be a great opportunity. Uh, so we head off, a few kids and uh, another a couple of adults and I, uh, to go and be a part of this mission. And this church had just acquired the building beside of it. This was a downtown inner city church, okay? So people from uh, Oblong uh, uh, were a little out of their own element uh, in uh, a place uh, like this. In fact, while we were there, there were many people just wandering around, and we started to ask what was going on, and the people in charge told us, you don't want to know. You, you don't pay attention. We live in a really rough neighborhood. These people need Jesus. You're here to help us get these people uh, to understand who Jesus is. And so our goal that day was to take this new building, this house, that was right next door to the church, and clean it out so that they could use it for a children's area. I have not seen so much filth in my life. We were taking grain scoops and scooping dirt and garbage out of this house so that they could then turn it into a, a place, a redeemed place, where they can teach young people uh, about Jesus. It was such a rough area that as the plan was to go and work for the day uh, and then have them take care of us uh, with a meal and then just stay there in the church building and sleep there uh, at night. Of course, they had all kinds of alarms and things uh, run through the church to provide us with safety. Uh, and it was about the time that we were getting ready to eat that one of the adults looked at me and said, Mark, we are not staying here tonight. <laughs> okay, I'll take your wisdom. Uh, I understood that. But still the issue is we had to get that place cleaned up. What was there was dirt and filth and had it was not going to be a situation that God could be praised in. And so we cleaned and we scrubbed and we removed to get it ready for them to have a children's church area in that. And that's what Paul is trying to say here, that your body is a temple in that way, that you are planned so that God can live in you so that other people can see Jesus through you. That's why when he talks about these lawsuits, and don't take people to court, other Christians to court, Settle it within the church. Have someone who can give you guidance, who understands you. And that's why when he says those things, he's drawing our attention back to being the people that God has called us to be, his children, and living that way. I don't know if many of you saw my wife's post. I think sometimes she's uh, probably uh, pretty well noticed. Uh, but uh, yesterday, the day before, uh, we, we started school again, trying to get everything busy and all that stuff. And uh, we have been uh, trying to run around crazily uh, this past week. And uh, I noticed it uh, a couple days ago. <laughs> and she happened to notice it and take a picture of it yesterday. Uh, the sock, uh, team sock. We had a sock right there in, in the middle of our kitchen. The kitchen's not anywhere close to the laundry room. Uh, there's no reason that even the kids take their laundry. We do have dogs. <laughs> I did say that. Uh, but this sock has laid there for a week in front of the stove. Uh, and there was a point where I'm like, I'm going to pick it up. And there's a point that I'm like, I'm not 
I'm going to pick it up. I'm going to wait and see. I want to guilt somebody uh, to make them uh, get the sock picked up uh, and put in the right place. And of course, everybody in the family walks by there. And I don't think that they can see. I think teenagers, their vision stops right about here. There's nothing. They walk over the biggest messes uh, in their inability uh, to take care of the things that are right there in front of them. In the same way in our own lives, too. But what I want to say that is this, and the reality of her post was, we're busy. This is we're getting ready. We we have a life. We're, we're both of us work, and the kids are all a, a part of uh, their own jobs and other things. It, it's crazy sometimes how a little thing like that can be out of place for so long, and that's true. But what I want to challenge you with today is, you can't use that metaphor in your life with Jesus. You can't say, "Oh, Jesus is just a sock." Because what Jesus wants from you, most of all, is for you to live your life redeemed for Him, cleansed for Him, washed for Him, sanctified for Him. we got way too many Christians who live life with a dirty sock still laying there. And everyone else, as they walk by their life, sees the dirty sock. And they're like, why do I want to go to a church? See the dirty sock? <laughs> I don't think actually it's a dirty sock. I think the dogs probably had gotten it. Uh, the right place. Let, let me say that to get myself uh, off the hook later on. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, this video probably won't make it. Uh, uh, right. But church, we can't live that way. Because God calls us to be sanctified. He calls us to live differently. When people see our lives, it's not okay to justify it and say, well, at least I'm better than... No, 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 no. You have Jesus in your heart. You have to live rightly for that reason. Clean up your house. Get it ready. We need to live repentantly. We need to stop what we're doing and allow God's Spirit to change our desires. We need to allow ourselves to find discipline in reading and prayer and eliminating the traps and the snares that the enemy has for our destruction. Chapter 6 is a harsh one, but we're reminded, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? When you who have come from God, you are not your own. And the amazing thing is, Jesus paid for us and bought us with a price. And so we need to, as the verse ends, glorify God with our body. We come into that time in our service to say, okay, God, what do I need to do? What is laying around the house <laughs> uh, that I need to get cleaned up? Uh, well, what is it that, that uh, you need us to do to get ourselves ready so that we can be better witnesses for you? Uh, the good news is that God knows our hearts, and he's provided for us a way. He has given us strength, and he's given us his presence, and he's given us the power to say no to sin and temptation uh, as we learn to discipline and lean upon him. If you need to make a decision for Jesus, we come to that time in our service uh, for a decision him to say, okay, God, do I need to take these steps to follow you? You've made it apparent. How can I do it? I don't think I have the power myself. Know that we want to share with you. We want to pray for you. We want to encourage you to take in those steps. If you need to make a decision for Jesus, to be washed, to be baptized, to have your sins washed away, to get direction and to get... Uh, aid and encouragement uh, for living the right way, come forward as we stand and say uh, our hymn of decision. Uh, number 636, uh, I Must Tell Jesus. Let's stand. I must tell Jesus
happy to give. Uh, thank you for your promises that don't leave us in our own sins, that provide a way for us uh, to find light uh, and clean, be cleansed uh, through you. Uh, we thank you for all that you do uh, in making us right with you. Please, Lord, forgive us that we can find uh, the joy of living for you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Let's move along then to the Lord's Supper. Uh, the communion hymn will be 635 uh, in the garden, just there across the page. Uh, let's uh, sing the first and the third verse, if the guys will come forward uh, on the third verse, uh, and uh, we'll partake of communion together that way in the garden. <coughs>
including Connie. <laughs>